Buenas tardes a todos. I'm delighted to introduce this magnificent presidential panel on 1968 and the 50th anniversary. As we know, the celebrations and commemorations have certainly begun, and what is very clear is that we have had, and we, we had, and we have had, and we have many 1968s. While in Latin America, the massacre of Tatelolco has become a global reference, we know that 1968 was lived differently and meant different things across the Americas. This panel attempts to capture this diversity, continuing to place Latin America within global processes and debates. The 50th anniversary offers an opportunity to review the sea changes prompted by the new social movements and contestatory cultures that characterize this year, as well as the reactions to conservative resistance they prompted. We count on four fine ponentes. We will begin with Gerald Martin, who is a writer, translator, and independent scholar. His presentation is entitled, The 60s, Has Anything Happened Since? Hello, nice to see you all. Uh, very good to be here. Uh, Lhasa has always been my favorite conference in the world by uh, a very long way. Haven't been to one for a very long time because uh, I'm really not, not an academic anymore. Um, uh, but uh, it's fantastic to be here, fantastic to be in Barcelona. Um, my first contact with uh, the Spanish world was Barcelona in 1959. Um, and uh, here I am all these years later. Um, talking about the 1960s, which hadn't even happened when I uh, first came here. Um, as far as I can see, I am by a very long way the oldest man in this entire conference. <laughs> and uh, since the conference has five or 6,000 people, as far as I can uh, work out, um, that does make me quite unusual. So I offer myself more, since I don't have great wisdom to offer you, um, I'm going to offer you myself as a relic um, and as a specimen, uh, and I'm going to talk a bit about um, uh, how the 60s looks to me now um, and everything that's happened since, both in Latin America um, and indeed in the uh, world. I've always thought that uh, LASA was a 60s institution. Um, I think it still is. Um, NACLA too was a 60s institution um, and just about is as well uh, stints. Um, both LASA and uh, NACLA have managed to ignore everything else that was going on and to retain in a 60s kind of identity. Um, the 60s was what I myself um, uh, was wanting in the 1950s um, when I was a teenager. And uh, I've really stayed in the 60s ever since. Um, if there'd been anything better afterwards, uh, obviously I would have embraced it um, and uh, entered into it, but um, I honestly can't see uh, what there is. Okay. Um, my title, um, and funnily enough, over the last weeks, I, how long ago did we send the titles in, Chuck? I can't oh. remember. It was closer to 1968 than to today, like. <laughs> 25 years ago. It was a long time ago. Um, I've been obviously Googling 1968 and the 60s in the last few weeks, and to my complete astonishment, I found that my title isn't in the least original, <laughs> and um, that uh, variants on my title exist all over the place. Um, so uh, one is never as original as one would, um, would like to be. I, um, my title comes from a perception, um, which probably lots of people have had, but I've had it very strongly. Had it for a long time, but, but, but had it um, strongly in the last few years um, as I've uh, reached old age. Which is that if I think back to the 1960s, and I think, for example, of seeing films of 50 years before, or photographs, or read things of 50 years before, the differences just hit you straight between the eyes immediately. Everybody looked totally different. Uh, they had different body language. They were wearing different clothes. The transportation was different. Uh, the music was different. Everything was incredibly different um, from the 1960s backwards. 
Uh, I can still remember vividly what all those films were like. And even things from the 1950s and the 1960s were really quite a long way away. Um, but things from the 1910s and 1920s, and the 1920s has always been a big point of reference for me, as for so many other people, everything was so totally different. Then I look back at the 1960s, and uh, this isn't the case. And thinking about this, I, um, I, I dug out a picture from, from me. You can't see it, but uh, uh, this is me and some friends. And in fact, my printer wasn't working either, so it, it hasn't come out very well. But this is me and my three friends at, uh, at, at university in the 1960s. Well, we've got a look on our faces that was the 1960s, which is that we thought the future belonged to us and that we were the future and we knew what it was going to be like and it was going to be fantastic. But apart from that, we could be dressed just the same today. Everybody's wearing just the same things today as they were wearing in the 1960s. Uh, the men were all wearing jeans, uh, sweaters, t-shirts. The women were wearing what they wanted for the first time in history and have carried on doing it uh, ever since. So the 1960s, it seems to me, was the beginning of, of, of now. Um, my friend in front in the picture, which you can't see, um, uh, was in a rock group. This was at university called Montezuma and the Aztecs. Uh, Zuma spent Z-O-O-M-E-R. Um, I uh, met my wife at one of his rehearsals. Um, he was playing one evening when John F. Kennedy was killed. Um, in this picture, uh, I'd just been to Paris for two weeks because we didn't have credits in Britain, so you could just clear off and go and do things during term time, and I'd just been to Paris for two weeks. I was just about to go grow my hair and go to Spain uh, for two months over the summer in a red uh, pickup truck with, with, with these guys. And in that sense, everything was, uh, everything was, was, was the same. Um, I went to Bolivia in 1965. I, I went in a Boeing 707 in 1965. It went at five or 600 miles an hour, um, just like they do now. Um, when I went to Spain in my pickup truck, we drove at 70 miles an hour, just like we do now. Um, so we wore the same clothes, we did the same things. Rock music had started, the Beatles began in 1962. They dominated our entire uh, university life. Um, Beatles are still the greatest rock group, uh, not rock group, pop group. Uh, the Rolling Stones were there. They're the greatest rock and roll band in, uh, in, in history. They're still around, still touring, even going around Latin America. They've even been to Havana now. Um, the boom writers were there in Latin America. Um, Mario Vargas Llosa is still the most important and influential writer in Spain or Latin America. Uh, 60 years later, and if Gabo was still alive, well, they'd still be fighting it out and punching one another and so on uh, for supremacy. So in one way, um, things are very much the same. It was the first time in history that young people became in some way dominant, became the spirit of the age, um, and they've remained not dominant any longer, as we've seen recently in my country, where the young people all voted to stay in the European Union, and the old people uh, all voted to, uh, to go out. And so we've got Brexit, which is the British uh, equivalent of um, Trump. I'm not going to say anything about Trump in case I offend anybody in the room. Uh, but uh, anyway, um, we have our own problem. And in some ways, it might last um, a lot longer than Trump. I dug out something that I remembered from Garcia Marquez in the 1980s, uh, which was um, the moment when we realized that uh, we weren't the future and it wasn't all going to turn out uh, as we thought. And uh, Garcia Marquez's article is called Si, la nostalgia sigue siendo igual que antes. And it's about the death of John Lennon. And uh, I was in Mexico in 1968 to 9, so I know that there was a channel in Mexico City devoted entirely to the Beatles. And I know that for the whole year that I was there, all you could hear was the Beatles. And by 1980, I knew that Garcia Marquez had written Cien, Cien Años de Soledad, listening to the Beatles. And uh, this is what he says. <clears throat> 
ha sido una victoria mundial de la poesía. En un siglo en que los vencedores son siempre los que pegan más fuerte, los que sacan más votos, los que meten más goles, los hombres más ricos y las mujeres más bellas, es alentadora la conmoción que ha causado en el mundo entero la muerte de un hombre que no había hecho nada más que cantarle al amor. Es la apoteosis de los que nunca ganan. Durante 48 horas no se habló de otra cosa. Tres generaciones, la nuestra, la de nuestros hijos y la de nuestros nietos mayores, teníamos por primera vez la impresión de estar viviendo una catástrofe común. Y por las mismas razones. Los reporteros de la televisión le preguntaron en la calle a una señora de 80 años cuál era la canción de John Lennon que le gustaba más. Y ella contestó, como si tuviera 15, la felicidad es una pistola caliente. Un chico que estaba viendo el programa dijo, a mí me gustan todas. Mi hijo menor le preguntó a un muchacho de su misma edad por qué habían matado a John Lennon y ella le contestó, como si tuviera 80 años, porque el mundo se está acabando. And what Garcia Marquez is telling us there is that, although of course generational differences are bound to continue, they've never been the same uh, since the 1960s. Um, my father didn't like a lot of things, um, but he did like the popular music that happened then. And if you think about it, our entire lives have been accompanied by uh, the electric guitar uh, ever since the 1960s. It's just absolutely everywhere. It's never changed. I don't know when it's going to. I wish in a way it would, but, um, but, but uh, it hasn't. I've become very disillusioned with uh, El País over the last 10 or 15 years, a newspaper that is very important to me, which is the newspaper record of Spain um, since the transition in the uh, 1970s when Spain showed that you could become a totally different country um, from one day to the other, uh, apparently. Uh, wonderful newspapers become much more conservative. Uh, it's it's undoubtedly, undoubtedly neoliberal now. Um, the Catalan question has just kind of finished it off. Um, El País is now just a, you can think what you like about the Catalan question, but El País only thinks one thing about it, um, unfortunately. But it's had an absolutely wonderful, in my country, I've seen three, four articles on the 60s in the whole of this year. Um, even The Guardian hasn't done very much. But El País has had the most wonderful series, um, and uh, it's been going on for months. And um, I'll just give you some titles. This is a very 1960s thing to do. I'll give you some titles that will suggest um, the way things are. Um, Vivimos aún en la era del 68 um, is one of those titles, um, which is more or less the theme um, that I'm giving you. Or another one, Mayo no acaba nunca. Or another one, la insumisión permanente, that's a very optimistic one, but uh, there it is. One by a feminist, lo que queda de Mayo del 68 es lo que todavía no es. One by Pedro Romero, Crear Situaciones. The whole question of the Situationist movement is something really important that, that not enough people have studied, but that really was important. And of course, Mario Vargas Llosa himself wrote uh, just a few years ago, La Civilización del Espectáculo, which is a kind of uh, counterwork to uh, the works of de Boer um, in the 1960s. Uh, someone else wrote, Que medio siglo uh, no es nada. Uh, presumably thinking of, uh, of Gardel, and on and on it goes. Um, they're all the same kind of theme, which is my theme. Um, are the 60s over? What was the promise? Um, has it all been realized? Um, I, of course, um, well, I say of course. I'm saying of course. I, I've spent a lot of time um, in the last 25 years studying García Márquez, um, Cien Años de uh, Soledad. Um, I thought as early as the 1970s that, I um, can't believe I've been talking for 18 minutes, um, that uh, the book was the materialization 
in the Spanish-speaking world of uh, Marshall McLuhan's work, um, The Global Village, uh, and all the other things that he did. But it was also uh, not just showing us that everywhere was now part of a globalized world, and that the local and the global uh, were going to coexist, and that we would have to start learning how to do it, which we still haven't learned to do, but we're, we're all trying. Um, but also, there was something in 100 Years of Solitude, and like a thousand other things, I, I'm never going to do it now, but I always wanted to write uh, something that would show the way in which Garcia Marquez used time, um, the meanings of time in the novel, the different time zones in which people lived in the novel, the different world view they had in terms of time, and looking at Marshall McLuhan's views of time as well. Um, there's something about time, and of course it fits with the theme of what I'm saying, um, which is that in a way it doesn't pass. I've got older and older and older, um, but in one way I haven't lived in time in the way that I've always thought that people did in the period before um, the 1960s. So um, we are all in the global village, more and more and more. Um, I'm going to summarize the other 20 pages that I, I, I've got written in terms of notes, um, but the only two things that I can see um, that are tremendously new since um, the 1960s, and the, these were both anticipated by Marshall McLuhan, are uh, the internet uh, on the one hand and the genome on the other. These strike me as the two uh, astonishing changes that, that we need to confront. As for the rest of it, um, we, we, we seem to have nightmares around us like Trump and Brexit and votes about Colombian peace and Catalan uh, independence movements and, and all of that. Thank you very much. I'm sorry that that was so disorganized. <laughs> Thank you. We will now hear, hear. Oh, yes. Sorry. Thank you very much, Gerard. We will now hear from Carlos Aguirre from the University of Oregon, who will speak on Cuba's 1968, The Garden of Forking Paths. Thank you, Chuck, for uh, organizing the panel and inviting me. Thank you all for coming. I will be reading uh, because I need to stay on uh, the 50-minute uh, limit. Hopefully, I will be able to accomplish that. Uh, on April 9th, uh, 1968, Casa de las Américas in Havana published the Cuban edition of Cien Años de Soledad, the novel that would forever change Latin American and world literature and whose first edition had been published the previous year in Buenos Aires, as um, most of you certainly know. On October 10, 1968, Fidel Castro gave a speech to commemorate the centennial anniversary of the beginning of the anti-colonial rebellion by Carlos Manuel de Céspedes that would lead to the so-called Ten Years' War. In that speech, Fidel stated that Cuba was completing 100 años de lucha, 100 years of struggle. The reference to Gabo's novel was pretty obvious as it was Fidel's desire to link the revolution to a longer history of Cuban nationalist, anti-colonial, and anti-imperialist efforts. Beyond Fidel's rhetoric, what is certainly true is that by 1968, almost 10 years after the beginning of the revolution, Cuba continued to struggle against U.S. economic embargo uh, and hostility, diplomatic isolation, and economic shortages. I did something with uh, Zoom. this? Yep. Oops. Well, okay. Um, sorry about that. Gosh. Those seconds don't count, right? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> what did I do? Okay. Um, okay. Beyond Fidel's rhetoric, <clears throat> what is certainly true is that by 1968, almost 10 years after the victory of the revolution, Cuba continued to struggle against U.S. economic embargo and hostility, by diplomatic isolation and economic shortages. The revolution also struggled to maintain and expand the social reforms that had benefited the Cuban people since January 1959. Because of this, its resistance in defense of an of its autonomy and dignity and its insistence on a socialist and egalitarian path, by 1968, the revolution was still, for many around the world, and particularly in Latin America, a source of inspiration. Although armed struggle had begun to decline as the main revolutionary tool, and Che Guevara had been killed just a few months uh, earlier, 
The Cuban example continued to inspire revolutionary and utopian dreams in both developed and underdeveloped societies. The denunciations of US intervention in Vietnam in other parts of the world was an important component of 1968, and in that, Cuba could be seen as a bastion of anti-imperialist resistance. Che Guevara posters were visibly everywhere as he came to symbolize people's rebelliousness against the status quo. The spirit of the Cuban Revolution, thus, was an important, although not always central, ingredient behind the mobilization of students and workers and their critique of bourgeois society, totalitarianism, and traditional ideas of cultural gender and generational roles. At the same time, however, there were political and cultural developments in Cuba that were counter to the spirit of 1968 and contributed to the gradual consolidation of a more rigid and authoritarian model. Certain signs had appeared earlier, certainly, instances of censorship or the repression against homosexuals and the creation of UMAPs or the Neruda affair in 1966. But 68 in Cuba proved to be a decisive year in the consolidation of a new course for the revolution. It could be argued that for Cuba, 1968 started a few months earlier with the death of Che Guevara in October 1967. It marked the end of an era marked by revolutionary idealism, resistance to the Soviet model, and active promotion of guerrilla-style revolution. And it marked thus the beginning of a gradual entrenchment of a more Soviet-like model, which would reach its peak in the 1970s, particularly during the so-called Quinquenio Gris, the period of cultural repression that, as writer Leonardo Padura has pointed out, was actually longer than a Quinquenio and darker than gray. He and others have referred to it as El Decenio Negro. In January 1968, Cuba held an International Congreso Cultural in Havana, a major event that gathered hundreds of Cuban and foreign intellectuals to discuss a number of issues, but quite centrally, the role of intellectuals in the revolutionary process. The Congress reaffirmed the subordination of culture, arts, and creation to the needs of the revolution. In a lengthy speech at the end of the Cultural Congress, Fidel launched a frontal attack against the US, defended the legacy of Che Guevara, and praised intellectuals for their role in the struggle against imperialism. But he also questioned what he referred to as intellectual individualism. El análisis, las concepciones, cada vez más tendrán que ser la obra de equipos de hombres, más que de hombres individuales, said uh, Fidel. Critical thinking was encouraged, but only to the extent that it stayed within the parameters of the revolution. The final declaration signed by the participants in the Congress stated that the fundamental duty of intellectuals was to resist imperialist aggression and to support struggles towards national liberation and decolonization of efforts in Asia, Africa, and Latin America. The subcommission that dealt with the issue of the responsibility of intellectuals went a little bit further with this rhetoric. Hacemos la revolución, luego existimos. But not every intellectual or topic was welcome in those debates in Havana in January 1968. Just to give an example, a particular group of black intellectuals, including Walterio Carbonell and Nancy Morejon, who were demanding a more clear and direct commitment of the revolution against racism and discrimination, um, were excluded. They were accused of opening a racial breach in the revolution, and some would, would eventually suffer various forms of ostracism, including temporary imprisonment. Simultaneously, the revolution intensified its hostility against multiple cultural manifestations, both local and imported, that were perceived as counter-revolutionary. Foreign music, most notably rock and the Beatles, uh, fashion styles, long hair, mini skirts, religious beliefs, and most ominously, homosexuality, than in official propaganda was equated with foreign cultural alienation and counter-revolutionary activities. As is clear, some of these manifestations that were central to the mobilizations of 1968 elsewhere were seen in the island as detrimental to the revolution and were effectively prosecuted. In 1971, during the first Congreso de, de la Educación y la Cultura, homosexuality was explicitly defined as a social pathology and thus a counter-revolutionary type of behavior. Respecto a las deviaciones homosexuales, se definió su carácter de patología social. Quedó claro el principio militante de rechazar y no admitir en forma alguna estas manifestaciones ni su propagación. 
los medios culturales no pueden servir de marco a la proliferación de falsos intelectuales que pretenden convertir el esnovismo, la extravagancia, el homosexualismo y demás aberraciones sociales en expresiones del arte revolucionario. Later that year, in August, as is well known, Soviet tanks invaded Czechoslovakia to put an end to the so-called Prague Spring, which very much in the spirit of 1968 was challenging the authoritarian communist regime. The Cuban press did not offer much coverage of those events as they were unfolding, and Fidel said nothing publicly about it until uh, the invasion took place. And as I'm sure you know, Fidel took a stand and publicly expressed his support to the intervention, which disappointed many on the left who still saw the Cuban process as more independent and democratic than the Soviet model. For Fidel, the Prague Spring was a movement that would take Czechoslovakia into the arms of imperialism, and thus intervention was justified. And later that year, in October, the Cuban cultural establishment would be shaken by the first phase of the Padilla affair, the scandal surrounding, surrounding the price that poet Eberto Padilla received for his book, Fuera del Fuego. The case is well known, and I will skip most of the details. Padilla was a poet who had worked for the revolution in a variety of positions, including that of head of the office in charge of uh, the cultural imports and exports. He was not yet an open critic of the revolution, but he had been involved in various polemics, including his defense of Guillermo Cabrera Infante, the already exiled writer, and his critique of Lisandro Otero, a man of the uh, intelligentsia uh, uh, in Cuba. Uh, Padilla's book was selected for the prize by a jury uh, formed by, among others, José Le Samalima. And there are multiple uh, reports and evidence of pressures from the top, including Raúl Castro himself and others, uh, try to press the jury not to award the prize to Padilla. Eventually, he received the prize. And in the resolution, the jury stated that Fuera del Juego, the, the poem, uh, the, the, the book of poems, se sitúa del lado de la revolución, se compromete con la revolución y adopta la actitud que es esencial al poeta y al revolucionario, la del inconforme, la del que aspira a más porque su deseo lo lanza más allá de la, rea de la realidad vigente. That characterization of Padilla's writings and of himself as a poet did not certainly convince the official intelligentsia in Cuba. The book was eventually printed because that was one of the conditions of the prize, but um, it appeared with a warning written by the uh, uh, Unión Nacional de Escritores y Artistas de Cuba's executive committee, the organizers of the, of the prize, according to which Padilla's book uh, was ideological, ideologically contrary to the revolution it uh, represented a defense of individualism against the needs of a society that is building its future, reflected an attitude of skepticism or critical rejection typical of a liberal intellectual that, in the Cuban context, they said, uh, it objectively, objectively becomes reactionary. Authors like Padilla, according to them, did not serve the revolution but its enemies. They were sort of Trojan horses of imperialism. What needs to be mentioned here is that several poems in that book had already been published in Cuba, including in Casa de las Americas, which means to me that the scandal surrounding the, the, the prize and the eventual publication of the book is a clear indication of the tightening of control of dissent in Cuba around 1968. As Jorge Fornet has underlined by 1968, the official line of Cuban cultural politics was being said by Verde Olivo, the magazine of the Cuban Armed Forces. Apelar al órgano de las Fuerzas Armadas, writes uh, Jorge Fornet, era como sacar los tanques a la ciudad, letrada. Padilla's book, according to many sources, was not allowed to publicly, to openly circulate in Cuba, and some reports suggest that uh, the print run, or most of the print run, was burned and otherwise, or otherwise destroyed. Time constraints prevent me from addressing other instances of this increasingly hostile attitude towards intellectuals in Cuba, such as the attacks penned in Verde Olivo against specific writers, or the ostracism suffered by Walterio Carbonell and Manuel Moreno Fraginals and others, others that were critical of the revolution, although in no way could be considered counter-revolutionary. 
I do not have time either to do justice to the effective existence in Cuba of individuals, groups, and spaces, such as the magazine Pensamiento Critico, for instance, actively engaged in debates that did not necessarily follow or endorse the official line, or to the vibrant cultural and artistic scene in, that the Cuban population had access to thanks to an effective democratization of education and culture. Although the trend was clearly towards a tighter control of the cultural scene, critical and independent voices were not fully suppressed. To sum up, the examples offered in this brief presentation point to the contradictory nature of Cuba's 1968. On the one hand, the revolution was still, objectively speaking, conducting a heroic effort towards self-determination, the fulfillment of its promises to build a new society, resistance against U.S. hostility, and solidarity with national liberation movements around the world. The Cuban Revolution and Che Guevara inspired, at least in some cases, the mobilization of students and workers demanding more freedom and justice or denouncing U.S. intervention in Vietnam and other places. 1968 was not a socialist upheaval, certainly, but many participants in those demonstrations and strikes had sympathies for the revolution that was still perceived as a model of dignity and courage. On the other hand, many events of 1968 inside Cuba pointed in the opposite direction, that is, the adoption of a more rigid and authoritarian model of socialism. To a certain extent, the Decenio Negro uh, began in 1968. To say this does not imply ignoring the context in which this was taking place, what Rafael Hernandez has called el síndrome de la fortaleza sitiada. But even the most sympathetic defenders of the revolution would acknowledge that the way in which it responded to specific manifest manifestations of cultural and political dissent was way, of way out of proportion and revealed an authoritarian tendency that was at odds with the spirit of 1968. The revolution, it could be said, was actually trying to prevent a Cuban version of 1968. Thank you. Tenemos a Carlos Illades, de la Universidad Autónoma Metropolitana de México. El título es El 68 en el imaginario de la izquierda mexicana, una lectura política de José Revueltas. Gracias. Bien, buenas tardes. Eh, gracias a Choc por la invitación. Eh, la idea que quiero desarrollar en estos minutos es eh, eh, tratar de explicar cómo en la perspectiva de José Revueltas, el movimiento del 68 eh, cierra el ciclo de la Revolución Mexicana y eh, plantea la posibilidad eh, de, eh, de que en México transite no solo hacia la democracia, sino eh, eventualmente hacia el socialismo. José Revueltas es una figura, digamos, eh, fundamental de la izquierda mexicana. Podríamos decir que es un ícono de la izquierda mexicana en la medida en que representa, de un lado, la figura del intelectual disidente, del, del intelectual que eh, no negocia con el poder, el intelectual comprometido y, eh, y eh, desde una perspectiva eh, política radical. Pero de otro lado también es una figura muy importante porque a través de, de su trayectoria vital, que fue eh, finalmente breve, murió a los 61 años de edad, Revueltas eh, transita pues, casi desde su adolescencia, eh, a los 15 años eh, se, se vuelve comunista, se eh, afilia, se acerca a las juventudes comunistas hasta el final de su vida, todas las, metamorfosis, eh, la, la, todas las metamorfosis del ser comunista. Esto es, eh, Revueltas eh, pasa a lo largo de su breve vida desde la, pues el, la, la perspectiva estalinista, eh, con la cual rompe, digamos, en la, en la década de los 50, se acerca en la década de los 60 al trotskismo y eh, ha avanzado el movimiento del 68 y en el resto de su vida, incluso adoptará una, eh, una perspectiva, eh, llamémosle autogestionaria del, del, del comunismo. Entonces, a lo largo de una trayectoria eh, vital breve, desarrolla esta, eh, todas estas mutaciones posibles del ser comunista. 
Hay otra cuestión que también es fundamental y que lo convierte en una eh, figura icónica. Revueltas es eh, el gozne eh, entre la vieja izquierda comunista, la izquierda de carácter eh, obrerista, eh, con la nueva izquierda mexicana. También a lo largo de su vida se aprecia cómo puede jugar en este tránsito generacional, lo cual lo convertirá en el, el intelectual más importante eh, de, en el movimiento de 1968. Por esas tres razones me parece que es fundamental analizar eh, su eh, perspectiva con respecto a la Revolución eh, Mexicana y cómo cree que este ciclo se cierra con el movimiento del 68. Eh, eh, revueltas, eh, eh, lo que le decía al final, es gozne entre la, la izquierda obrerista eh, previa, precedente, y la izquierda, la nueva izquierda, en la medida en que adopta eh, la línea, digamos, o la simpatía que genera en América Latina la Revolución Cubana. Eh, yo creo que mientras en Europa la nueva izquierda se constituye mucho a partir de los movimientos sociales emergentes, en el caso latinoamericano el elemento decisivo es la Revolución Cubana. Y Revueltas estuvo eh, a principios de los 60, cuando estaba dedicado fundamentalmente a escribir eh, guiones cinematográficos, estuvo eh, varios meses en La Habana. Eh, decía hace un momento que Revueltas, eh, el, buena parte de su reflexión política se centra en la Revolución Mexicana. Revueltas es, a mi juicio, el crítico más fuerte de la Revolución Mexicana que dio la izquierda mexicana. De hecho, eh, adelanta muchas de las ideas que después expondrá eh, Roger Bartra en la jaula de la melancolía. En, eh, eh, Revueltas plantea desde la crítica, al menos en sus textos políticos, no me referiré a sus textos literarios, pero es desde la crítica que hace a Daniel Cosío Villegas, el ensayo que escribe en 1947 Cosío Villegas, que se llama La crisis de México, donde plantea cómo la Revolución Mexicana se está agotando, se ha convertido en una especie de neoporfirismo. Lo que planteará eh, Revueltas en su crítica es que el planteamiento de Cosío Villegas se queda corto y hay que explorar, digamos, de manera más profunda las raíces de este fracaso de la Revolución Mexicana. Después, en 1950, en su ensayo Posibilidades y limitaciones del mexicano, Revueltas hace una crítica demoledora de eh, la tesis de la filosofía de lo mexicano, en particular la de, la de Samuel eh, Ramos, con respecto a que la mexicanidad es una esencia. Lo que planteará eh, Revueltas es que el, el, la, la identidad, o lo que llamamos ahora identidad, es una historia, y es una historia que, eh, por tanto, está sujeta al cambio. Esto eh, me parece fundamental porque establece, por ejemplo, un paralelo con Octavio Paz, que será justo en ese mismo año cuando eh, publique eh, El laberinto de la soledad. Después, en México, una democracia bárbara, escrito en 1958, Revueltas hará la, la crítica más severa a, eh, tanto al, al sistema político mexicano como a la perspectiva política de su mentor Vicente Lombardo Toledano. Y después, en el ensayo sobre un proletariado sin cabeza, en 1962, Revueltas dirá que, el, 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 por un lado, la, la, el, 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 el proletariado mexicano no tiene una dirección política que le permita emanciparse, y por otro lado, deberá emanciparse este proletariado mexicano de la losa que significa el nacionalismo revolucionario, esto es la ideología de la Revolución Mexicana. Esto es, para revueltas, eh, la Revolución Mexicana genera una ideología que es alienante para la clase trabajadora y, por tanto, será necesario despojarse de esa ideología, de esa alienación, para que la, la clase obrera se emancipe. Pero, al mismo tiempo, considera revueltas que el Partido Comunista Mexicano no ha cumplido esa función. Y será, repito, en 1968, cuando consume 
esta eh, eh, crítica a propósito de su intervención y participación en el movimiento estudiantil. Eh, Revueltas, eh, se, prácticamente en el movimiento del 68, se traslada a vivir a Ciudad Universitaria, eh, está ahí eh, durante varios meses, eh, a, eh, lo llevan los estudiantes en algunos momentos para protegerlo, a, eh, sobre todo después del de 2 de octubre, lo llevan a sus casas, digamos, para resguardarlo, pero va y viene todo el tiempo y muchos días incluso estuvo allí. El caso es que a Revueltas lo aprenden el 15 de noviembre de 1968 y permanece dos años y medio en la cárcel. Y eh, eh, cuando eh, lo liberan, eh, nunca eh, recupera, digamos, la condición eh, de, 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 digamos, de un hombre enteramente libre. Revueltas quedará sujeto a proceso eh, hasta el momento de su muerte. Bueno, el día que lo aprenden, había dado revueltas una conferencia en Ciudad Universitaria sobre la autogestión académica y la universidad crítica. Estos dos eh, planteamientos, estos dos conceptos, serán los elementos eh, fundamentales cómo abordará a lo largo de los siguientes años el problema universitario. Eh, su reflexión va más o menos en el sentido eh, siguiente. Eh, para revueltas, la clase obrera está imposibilitada en ese momento de realizar la revolución por las razones que he expuesto. Y eh, revueltas lo que considera es que transitoriamente el movimiento estudiantil será el depositario de la conciencia crítica eh, en la medida en que está generando formas de reflexión no alienadas y después esto dará oportunidad al desarrollo de una revolución de carácter socialista. Para él, la universidad crítica es el elemento fundamental de la creación de una conciencia colectiva. De hecho, para él, la universidad se convierte en el 68 en el cerebro colectivo. Esto es la perspectiva gramsciana con respecto del partido político. Y de otro lado, la, la práctica que hará posible este pensamiento crítico, este nueva, esta nueva forma de, de, de reflexión y de asociación entre los eh, universitarios, es la eh, autogestión académica. Esto es una relación igualitaria entre los que eh, conforman la universidad y que les permitirá desarrollar un pensamiento crítico que para eh, eh, Revueltas es fundamental. Es así que para el, eh, el escritor, para Revueltas, eh, eh, la, eh, la convergencia eh, de estas dos perspectivas, la que tiene que ver con eh, una universidad crítica no alienada y, por otro lado, una práctica autogestiva, darán la posibilidad de un eh, desarrollo de la conciencia al nivel de permitir una nueva revolución en el país. De hecho, ahí enfrenta radicalmente la perspectiva del centralismo democrático, del, del, del comunismo oficial, en el sentido de que las relaciones, digamos, políticas son eh, de carácter eh, vertical. Para revueltas, como señalé hace un momento, estas relaciones políticas tienen que ser fundamentalmente horizontales. De tal manera que revueltas, y ahí también establezco el paralelo con Octavio Paz, en 1968 y de ahí en adelante, eh, esta, eh, planteará que la revolución eh, próxima, la revolución que se dará en México a partir de las jornadas universitarias, será fundamentalmente una revolución democrática. Esto es, es el que, el de los primeros, o tal vez el primero, que introduce dentro de la izquierda comunista mexicana la idea de que la revolución eh, futura tiene que ser necesariamente una revolución democrática. Esto es, no es monopolio del pensamiento liberal mexicano eh, la idea de que la democracia va asociada con eh, la revolución. Y esto, por supuesto, tiene mucho que ver con la experiencia que ha visto o que está sucediendo más o menos simultáneamente en el bloque socialista, en particular en eh, la antigua eh, Checoslovaquia. Eh, bien, para él esta nueva revolución debe consistir o debe tener dos fases. 
De hecho, la primera fase es la que él está viendo en el movimiento estudiantil. La primera fase es una revolución de carácter estudiantil, pero, insisto, para él esta revolución estudiantil tiene un carácter transitorio, porque nunca se despoja de la idea que el sujeto revolucionario es la clase obrera. Entonces, mientras la clase obrera va recuperando su autonomía de conciencia, su autonomía de acción, esta eh, conciencia, digamos, transitoriamente está en el movimiento estudiantil. Entonces, la primera fase de la nueva revolución será la revolución estudiantil. Y la segunda fase, él le llama autodeterminación política de todos los sectores del pueblo, será el segundo momento de la revolución en el cual ya será la propia clase obrera la que encabece el movimiento social mexicano. Y de hecho, allí lo que plantea, y esa es una de las herencias que ha asimilado del trotskismo, que tendrá que haber un, un momento de transición, un programa de transición, de hecho así lo llama, como el famoso texto de Trotsky de 1938, el que da lugar a la, a la Cuarta Internacional, y le llama el, eh, el, el, la, la, la plataforma de transición de la izquierda. Esta plataforma de transición de la izquierda, y ahí termino, debe basarse en cuatro cosas. En primer lugar, en una reforma universitaria que haga ley lo que fue la eh, autogestión académica y la universidad crítica, la independencia sindical y política de la clase trabajadora, una democracia agraria y una apertura democrática que dé registro legal a todos los partidos políticos. Gracias. And now we have Diana Sorensen from Harvard University, whose paper is titled A Global 1968, question mark. Thanks so much, Chuck. And I just want to make sure I keep to my allotted time. Do I make it until one? Four?
England from the University of Michigan. Thank you. So I have to say I have the best of all jobs and the worst of all jobs. The best in that I got to read all of these presentations ahead of time and sort of think about them and chew on them for a couple of days. And the worst is that I probably have five minutes to try to synthesize and say something to you because I am in between you and the panelists. And that's a, you know, not a great position to be in. Um, so I'll start out by saying that our, the panel description, if you read the little description about what we were trying to accomplish, it notes that we're still debating the significance and the legacy of this transformative year in Latin America, that this is still sort of an open question. And true to form, the presentations that we've just heard did not actually offer us a definitive answer to this question, or even really four attempts at definitive answers. But rather, they point to the persistence of what Diana calls our twin drives of nostalgia and reassessment, in which we continuously look back to that period for inspiration, especially if what for many of us is a very bleak present moment, while we also continue to ask new questions about that year. And in that sense, I think it's actually fantastic that nobody tried to give you like, here it is, and this is what it means, that in fact, this is continually in process. Um, so I'm similarly unable and unwilling to offer one response to this question of what is the legacy of 1968 in Latin America, and I think that this constant questioning is itself useful. It's generative of new ideas about the present, about who we are, how we got here, and most importantly, about where we want to go. So that said, I'm just going to offer two or three quick reflections that emerged for me when reading the papers together. The first is that I'll say I find it endlessly ironic and also puzzling the ways in which Latin American, the Latin American 1968 continues to be understood by those outside of Latin America as a kind of other 68, as if it were apart from or even secondary to some real 68 that took place somewhere else. Um, and so, you know, you mentioned all the multiple commemorative activities happening in various newspapers. I've already, you know, also been involved in, in some really wonderful, well-intentioned and incredibly brilliant conferences about 1968, but that nonetheless take on as their agenda, including Latin America, you know, the other 1968 or what happened in Latin America. Um, and these papers speak not just to the kind of here to of the Latin American 1968, but really to the centrality of Latin America to the global 1968 both for the events that took place um, and for the ideas that were circulating and generated in real time, as well as for what we might think of as the later creation of legacies of 1968, right? The later ideas that we have globally constructed about what 1968 comes to mean. Um, and I'm thinking here, um, Gerald's paper about the world being irremediably moved by the boom of Cien Años de Soledad, which you get a sense of that in his comments, um, to Cuba as a site of inspiration, a place of peregrination, and perhaps a site of a collective will not to see um, in 1968. And then, and then Mexico is this critical participant in global political debates, both before, during, and after 1968, and, and the centrality of Tlatel um, So to me, this feels almost like older visions that we had of the Cold War that didn't originally think about Latin America, and today are unthinkable, that you wouldn't imagine the Cold War without that. And I feel like we should be there in terms of 1968. It's unthinkable that this is not the way that the world th reflects on this moment. My second point would be that I still think we need to guard against romanticizing the year of 1968, although not in the same terms that we used to do, but in the ways in which we can still totter on the precipice of understanding 68 as the roots of all things sort of contestatory. And I'm not trying to lean toward Deleuze in any way and sort of say that everything and nothing happened, but to warn us against putting into 1968 everything that today we find valuable, everything that today we want to see its origins as stemming from that moment. Um, so Carlos Aguirre showed this for Cuba, right, that 68 was also this moment of persecution of intellectuals, of gays, of those promoting an anti-racist agenda, and others. Um, and I would say this is not exclusive to Cuba, right? Certainly new work on the armed movements of the Southern Cone and of the intellectual left demonstrate the significance of homophobia and what Christopher Dunn calls homo-derisive attitudes that were a part and parcel of 1968. And I wonder if we shouldn't see these as aberrations to 1968, as exceptions to 1968, but part of the way that 1968 transpired and part of the legacy of those who did make those struggles to, uh, manifest themselves, right? One of the hurdles that they needed to overcome in some ways might be the constructions um, that we might today think of as um, non-progressive or even reactive and reactionary that occurred in 1968. So if we think about this more critically, we might see 1968 uh, differently. And I was thinking too here, um, Carlos Illade is telling us about Jose Revueltas being inspired living among students. And one of the things that was really inspirational to him was the horizontality of the Mexican student movement. Um, but Elaine Carey might tell us that it was not experienced that, by, that way by women students. 
And so when we kind of bring that into our, our vision of 68, what does that do? The kind of contradictory nature of all of the 1968s. Um, and then I guess the, the last comment that I'd make is that as we, as we assess 1968, and this is related, we might perhaps need to assess 1968 as a historical phenomenon and 1968 as a, cult as a, as a post-68 construction, right? The many interpretations and understandings of 68 that may have little or less to do with what actually took place than we think. Um, Gerald asks us, what was the promise of 1968? And we might ask, who made that promise, right? Or who has been continuing to make that promise? And so w I think keeping these two things in mind um, is helpful to us in understanding both the period and its legacies. And so with that, I hope that offers a couple of frameworks, and we should turn it over to questions. Yes. Yeah. Was that short enough? That was perfect. That was great. <laughs> Thank you. Bueno, muchas gracias por respetar el tiempo. Hicimos esto para que hayan preguntas. Eh, lo único que pedimos que sean preguntas más o menos breves, no ponencias. Todos hemos tenido experiencia. A las dos nos van a abrir la puerta. Y, así que, por favor, pregunta. Creo que no hay micrófono. Que sea nada más se levanten y un poco fuerte. Adelante. <laughs> but should we co we'll collect a couple, That's I think, right? Just for time, because right um, back there, yes. Is that okay? We'll collect a few. So a remember. Good point. Yes. Anyone else? Yeah, please. Al fondo. I come up so we can hear you. <laughs> yeah. Okay. <laughs> Good. Time for one more, perhaps, if there's not. If not, fantastic. So we'll maybe we'll go in the order that we presented. You, you have the future. Um. Well, of course, that's the question that I didn't want you to ask. So um, it's ama amazing. I can't really believe that you've asked me that question. I. Um, I would need uh, uh, several days to answer it, but. It, I would say that the template for Latin American literature in the last 50 years was created in the 1960s and that writers have been writing for or against the boom ever since. I still think, totally sincerely, that Latin American literature is the most interesting and vibrant literature that I know in the world, even today. But we don't live in the world that in, in the 1960s, it was still possible to con conceive of being a great writer. You, you, you could still be Hemingway or Faulkner or whatever, or Borges or Carpentier. Um, but uh, it's difficult for me to think of a Latin American writer, apart from Bolaño, of course, in the last 40 years, who is a absolutely recognizably, undeniably great writer in the way that but as I was trying to point out earlier, um, we don't even have great pop stars anymore. We had great pop stars in the 60s and 70s, but there aren't any David Bowies now or Pink Floyds or um, whatever there was. Um, 
It's a different era, and it's one that, that, that we haven't really understood yet. I do think that the attempts at um, uh, the, the claims of originality, for example, Macondo and the crack, um, didn't persuade me at the time and persuade me even less now. Um, uh, the crack certainly wasn't more interesting than the Onda in the 1960s. In fact, it's difficult for me to, uh, to, to see the difference. So, I mean, I think something really interesting has happened. I think that the world has become Latin Americanized, and even my own country now is involved in a quest for identity that wouldn't have even would have been inconceivable in the 1960s, but now everybody is in the Latin American condition. And so I couldn't really answer the question about uh, Latin American literature since um, without going into all of that. And um, you don't want me to go into all of that. <laughs> Yes, very briefly to address the uh, question about Peru. And yes, I agree, I'm, I'm Peruvian, just in case uh, you don't know. And when I was invited to this panel, I, I struggled between talking about Peru, which you know I happened to just uh, a few months ago, co-edited a book on the Velasco um, uh, government with my colleague, Pablo Drinor, who is here, allow me the commercial. Um, so I was torn between addressing Peru here in this panel and talking about Cuba. I, I ended up choosing Cuba because I'm working on that project now. But yes, uh, there are many 1968s that are usually forgotten. And Peru is one of those cases. As, as most of you know, there was a nationalist uh, revolution uh, conducted by the military going really against the current in Latin America those days. I still believe that uh, it, that, that process sort of contained the kind of contradictions that I've been talking about and that other colleagues here have addressed. It was, it was partly inspired by Cuba, and yet there were members of the armed forces that were really anti-communist, right? And uh, actually they discussed whether to reopen diplomatic relations with Cuba. One of the arguments was, but we are doing the same thing they are doing, that is nationalizing land, expropriating uh, property, and so forth. And the other side said, um, yeah, but Cuba is instigating guerrillas that are trying to destroy the armed forces in, in Peru and other countries. And it, 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 it took you know, fierce debates among them to eventually mm, you know, get closer to Cuba. And I'm also, I also believe that the, the, the Velasco revolution, this military revolution in Peru, was in a way uh, uh, a preventive revolution, one that uh, uh, wanted to change things so that Peru didn't go the Cuban way. Um, and of course, it wasn't as repressive as most of the other military regimes in Latin America, but it was certainly an authoritarian government. So uh, I think we need to uh, sort of expand the, uh, the reach of our discussions about 1968 by incorporating these other dimensions, including liberation theology, for instance, for which 1968 was really critical. And I'm sure there are many other cases that can be mentioned. Thank you. Bien, el movimiento del 68, yo creo que en México se vuelve un referente fundamental para los proyectos de la izquierda eh, a partir de ese año. Y en parte se construye un nuevo mito eh, acerca de la, eh, digamos, de la vía para la emancipación de las, de las clases subalternas. Esto es, eh, con Revueltas y el 68, creo que dentro de la izquierda se rompe el, el, la relación con la Revolución Mexicana, pero esta se volverá a recuperar en el año del 87-88, cuando aparece lo que dará lugar al partido de la Revolución Democrática, donde vuelve a ingresar, digamos, la, la, la revolución y, y su mito al, eh, al planteamiento de, de la izquierda. Eh, una, eh, ese alejamiento, digamos, eh, planteado teóricamente, creo que es eh, fundamental en el trabajo de José Revueltas. Eh, 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 por otro lado, también fija una agenda democrática, pero una agenda democrática que vaya más allá de la, de la propiamente electoral y que tenga que ver 
con la, eh, eh, el cambio radical, digamos, del régimen en, en tanto sistema corporativo, etcétera. Y eh, de otro lado, eh, el 68 también alienta a quienes no quedan eh, convencidos de que el régimen se puede transformar por una vía democrática a un periodo eh, importante de guerrillas en México que eh, se dará en, en, en los primeros años de la década del 70. Es decir, todavía hay guerrillas en México, pero hay un momento muy importante a principios de los 70 que tiene que ver con este de, desaliento por la eh, masacre de Tlatelolco y lo que se ve como imposibilidad de que el régimen se transforme. Bueno, muy brevemente y antes de que nos echen, eh, creo que son eh, tres eh, excelentes preguntas. Eh, simplemente trataría de unir la primera con la última. Eh, creo que porque la del medio es muy válida, hubiéramos estado aquí más que todo el tiempo de Lhasa si hubiéramos podido cubrir todo lo que era el 68 en América Latina. Simplemente pensar el boom y el, el momento de descontento y pesimismo en el que vivimos eh, como parte del fin de una especie de, en, en, lo que llamamos en inglés, the grand narratives of modernity. Y en el boom todavía se podía pensar en lo que eran los circuitos transnacionales a los que tenía acceso la literatura latinoamericana y llegó con toda su sorpresa y su novedad. Y todo eso en este momento es difícil de fabricar en ningún lugar. Eh, hemos tratado de crear la figura de Bolaño para que haya otro gran nombre y eso se nota claramente en las publicaciones traducidas y especialmente en inglés. Y con respecto a la pregunta que hacías sobre eh, lo que parecería ser el fin de la democracia, eh, me parece un tema de reflexión urgente y problemático y creo que ha habido, algo nos pasó en estos últimos 50 años eh, que nos ha dado un resultado que todavía estamos tratando de entender. Eh, espero que este no sea el último comentario pesimista que haga. Entonces, simplemente agradecer al público, al oponente. He tenido que prometer que íbamos a terminar la duda de la tarde y, y cumplimos, así que muchas gracias a todos. Seguimos conversando. Sí, sí.